So I want to get us started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are joining us. I am so excited to be here with you today to celebrate International Women's Day and for some of you, Women's History Month. My name is Deanna Vaca McGee and I am joining you from the land of the Piscataway, the native people who played a significant role in shaping the nation's capital here in Washington, D.C. I have the pleasure today of representing the American Heart Association as its global advocacy director. And our mission, if you don't know, is to be a relentless force for a world of longer, healthier lives. And I think that you all are joining me in that cause today. At AHA, gender equity has been a long-standing commitment from its early days in raising awareness of health, heart disease among women and women's representation in clinical trials and research. We continue to chip away at these inequities for women in America, and we recognize that as a high-income country, the U.S. continues to lag across a variety of metrics, including maternal health and women in leadership. This year, I have the pleasure of co-chairing the Task Force of Women in NCDs, which is a coalition working to address the unique and growing, growing burden of non-communicable diseases among women. Our coalition is supported by the secretariat that sits at the George Institute for Global Health in India. The George Institute, who is bringing today's webinar to you, has been a leading voice in advancing equality, particularly through its women's uh, health program. Through research, policy, and advocacy, this program aims to support the lifelong health of women across the world by addressing non-communicable diseases and injury, and by improving our understanding of the biological and social differences between women and men, and how those differences affect her health. On today's webinar, you will hear from some of its collaborators, and we hope you will walk away better understanding the global biases that exist, making women invisible in health and in medical research. Even though we're meeting virtually, please do get involved by posting your questions in the chat box. We'll be reviewing those throughout the webinar and we'll try to post your questions to the speakers and as many as possible. If you're a tweeter, I want you to hashtag advance equality. Also, please be aware that this event is being recorded and we will share it online and hope that you will disseminate it to your networks. So to kick us off, we'd love to know in a sentence posted in the chat box, what does advanced equality mean to you? Okay. I'm not seeing it. Let me see if I can see from the chat box. Here we go. Let's see. I'm not seeing all of them. So we will we will read through those. I'm I'm not getting a chance to see them all. Okay, help improve, drive improved access to opportunity and equity of outcomes. Thank you, Tina. Anyone else? Okay, all right. So I'm gonna do another poll. What do you think is the biggest killer of women globally? There's our poll coming up. Go ahead and answer. We'll give you a couple more Senate. Yeah. Oh, someone came up with cardiovascular disease. Very good, Louise Cooper, wherever you are coming from. Others? Okay. So in, in fact, it is, it, well, I am impressed. 50% of you said heart disease and you are actually correct. Um, some folks will, will fall more, most times when we ask that question, it, it falls in maternal mortality or in breast cancer. So I'm pleased that we've got a very educated group of, um, of participants today. Excellent. Thank you for entertaining us on, those, um, on, on, on this poll and there will be more. Now I want to um, start the program. We're gonna 
I'm going to make some introductions of our speakers. And first of all, I want to apologize for not recognizing all of their individual, professional, and personal accomplishments. I'll ask them to respond to the same question we had initially around what International Women Day means at the start of their presentations. But to kick us off, um, let me represent our, our speakers for today. Our first is Joanna Riha, who's a research fellow in the Gender and Health Hub at the United Nations University, and she's joining us from Malaysia. Dr. Kate Wilmersley is an honorary research associate at the George Institute for Global Health, and she's co-leading a project on sex gender, and she joins us from the UK. Dr. Sandi is a senior research fellow at the George Institute with extensive experience working with human rights-based approaches, including maternal health and youth and reproductive health rights and gender justice. And last but not least, Cristobal Thompson is the executive director of the Mexican Association of the Pharmaceutical Research Industries and a member of the board of directors of Direct Relief in Mexico. So let's now hear from our speakers. So I'm gonna send it over to you, Joanna. Thank you, Diana. So should I kick us off, I guess, in terms of answering the question, what does um, advancing equality mean for me? Yes, um, please do. It's really about um, collectively working towards diagnosing, but also very actively sharing solutions um, to tackle gender inequalities. And I think it's this shift from moving just on, just focusing on diagnosis to thinking about and sharing lessons with regards to how we address them um, that I think is really critical. So over the next seven minutes or so, I'm actually going to be presenting and, and focusing on a piece of work um, that I led prior to joining the United Nations University International Institute for Global Health here in Malaysia. Um, and it's a pleasure once again to be here this evening with everybody. Um, and thank you again to the George Institute for inviting me. Um, before I dive into my presentation and, and begin, I wanted to include a poll as well, if I can. Um, and I guess we can, yeah, kick off with a poll. So it's non-communicable diseases are the leading cause of death among women in Africa. So slightly different to the first question. Um, and this is a simple true or false. So if you can respond, and I'll give you a few, few seconds. I think this should be quick. Pick one. Um, and I'm just looking when the poll is in, it's in. So yeah, vast majority of you said it's true and, and it is in fact true. Um, so linked to it, cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of death among women in Africa, you know, considering the continent in terms of all 54 countries. Um, so if I can move to the next slide. Um, I mean, I think we're all, very much aware, and I think the poll indicates of, of the scale and real impact NCDs are having on um, women's health on the continent. However, this is really being underreported and under-researched. I mean, just to give you some figures to really put it in context, and I've updated these figures. Um, there's a, been an update to the Global Burden of Disease Study, but if we look at in 2019 alone across Africa, there were over 780,000 deaths among women due to cardiovascular diseases. And if we look at new cases with regards to cancer among women, there were 20 million. Um, and these are estimates, obviously, in terms of best available data, um, you know, projections, etc. But thinking about things like diabetes as well, 17 million women are, you know, were estimated to be living with diabetes on the continent in 2019. And, you know, very interestingly, uh, chronic respiratory diseases, I mean, here almost 100,000 women were reported to have died that year alone. And if we look at that figure globally, actually, if I'm not wrong, chronic respiratory diseases are actually the third leading cause of death among women globally in 2019. Um, and as we talk about NCDs, it's important to also um, consider their neurological conditions, but also mental health more broadly. And on the continent, in terms of prevalence of, of neurological conditions was actually found to be much higher among women compared to men. Um, and this is in addition to new cases um, of neurological conditions as well as, as mental health conditions. And as we are talking about you know, health outcomes, it's also important to consider um, inequitable access. And when we're talking about uh, addressing equality 
and how we move towards it, we have to really factor in provision and access to essential medicines and healthcare. And there is a huge gap. I'm not going to go into this. I'm going to present a bit of the findings because I think what was so unique about, about the piece of work that I did, and it was for the African Women's Development Fund. Actually, I should have mentioned this at the beginning. It was funded by the African Women's Development Fund. Um, and what was so unique about it is that, if I can move to the next slide, sorry. It was not just having a focus on, on mapping the scale and the key gendered concerns with regards to NCDs um, and the impact they're having on women on the continent. Mm -hmm. Um, it also looked at mapping key actors who were responding to the rise of NCDs, as well as what these actors were actually doing. Um, and then lastly, and this is the part that I'm going to focus on throughout my presentation, apologies, you can hear my son probably waking up on cue, um, but opportunities and challenges with regards to African women-led organizations around engagement um, for NCD prevention and control. And it's really about this fourth element, sorry, can I go back? It's really about this fourth element, sorry, um, where <laughs> we've all had this, I think, our yeah, kids and Zoom. Um, it's, it's really interesting because it was not just focusing on what the health sector could do. It was really about looking at um, rights-based women-led organizations and their role um, in advancing uh, gender equality within this particular health area. And so I think I just wanted to draw people's attention to this quote um, where it's important for us to think about supporting women's struggles beyond just the traditional health space, to think about land rights, the impact that has on women's health, equality of women with regards to agriculture, with regards to economic empowerment, education, food security, access to resources, all of this really contributes in terms of the response to NCDs. And this is where I think um, women-led rights-based organizations are a critical player. So I'm quickly going to run through some of the results. We did a survey, if I can move to the next slide. One of the components of the, the research we did was a survey looking at um, what rights-based organizations are doing. And of the 77 that did respond, they were not necessarily working in health. Um, we got responses from over 22 countries. The vast majority were working on NCDs, about 70%. And if you look at the pie chart at the bottom, um, the vast majority reported working on NCDs broadly. And then in terms of specific areas where they, where they did report this, um, most were working on cancer, diabetes, followed by cardiovascular diseases and mental health. Next slide, please. And just to give you a sense of what, what were some of these organizations doing? The vast majority of them were raising awareness, whether it was with regards to NCD prevention, NCD control, it was really about working with communities to raise awareness. They also worked, reported um, working on referring, uh, you know, community members to the right healthcare services, as well as some even providing services. Um, a smaller number were doing advocacy as well as capacity building. Some were working on fostering better partnerships um, with various stakeholders as well as research. Next slide, please. Um, and in terms of what were some of the challenges? So we asked them this question. And as you can see, if you look at the bottom of, of, of the, the diagram, lack of funds really stood out. Um, as the predominant challenge that many of these women-led uh, rights-based organizations were, were facing with regards to um, helping to tackle uh, NCDs um, within their communities. Others reported lack of expertise or knowledge, um, lack of staff to coordinate, um, et cetera. If I can move to the next slide, please. And so I'm going to wrap up. I'm conscious we only have seven minutes. I'm sorry it was such a a whistle to stop tour of, of the latter half of the report. But I wanted to draw, um, draw our attention to a few points um, as I'm concluding. And as we're thinking about how we move forward together, I think it's, it's critical we think about, you know, the strengths and contributions that women-led rights-based organizations can bring to this space. And this is thinking about community links, but also their expertise you know, not, not discrediting their expertise. And I think that really came through in the survey. The other was their links between the non-health and health sectors and, and sort of the bridge, the bridge role that they can play there. 
and also, you know, advocate for this more holistic consideration of women's health beyond just um, a sexual and reproductive health sort of framework. There's the ethical framing in terms of social justice. So many of them are involved in other struggles of social change, um, and they bring that to the public health you know, to this public health space, which I think is critical, and finally advocacy. So as we move forward, I mean, there has been a call, you know, in terms of financial support and increasing financial support. Um, and I think expecting them to do to do work for peanuts is, is, is not fair and not right, and not just. So we really need to work towards um, you know, better financial support with regards to what these organizations are doing as opposed to expecting them to do more for less. Um, continuing to build really meaningful partnerships with them. Um, and I think, although I said we need to move beyond diagnosing the problem at the start of my presentation, I think there is just so much to be done with regards to developing and, and building this evidence base on the impact of NCDs on women on the continent. So thank you very much. My final slide includes the link to the report if you would like to have a look at it. And thank you. I apologize, I'm two minutes over. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you so much. It, you were speaking to my heart uh, on NCDs and I've, I've come away from this really confirming that we need to work over cross sectors and, and reaching regions that we rarely hear about um, that are working in this space. So thank you very much. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Kate. Great, thanks, Deanna. Um, right, so, and thank you for the introduction. So I'm a doctor in psychiatry working in the NHS in Edinburgh, and I'm also a research associate. So just at, at the TGI, at the George. Um, and on the theme of advancing equality, what that means to me in my clinical practice is having confidence in research that I can accurately counsel my patients on evidence-based risks and benefits of treatments and interventions tailored to their sex, their gender, their age and their race. And unfortunately, we're quite some distance away from that. So the next slide, please, Anna. So I first became professionally interested in sex differences when I was at medical school in Cambridge in 2014. So Cambridge University has one of the oldest anatomy courses in the world taught through cadaveric dissection. Um, and as you can imagine, we learned about the human body in minute detail. So individual muscle groups, uh, arterial networks, the names of specific nerves. But there was a glaring omission. There was no teaching on breasts. They weren't mentioned. Despite being a huge cause of morbidity and mortality, it was as if this part of the body didn't exist. So um, with my great pal at medical school and now colleague at TGI, Dr. Catherine Ripalone, we forced our medical school to modernize. And you'll be glad to know that um, breasts are now on the syllabus. But this did make me think, you know, how many inequalities in medicine are hiding in plain sight? And my career so far in healthcare hasn't really reassured me. Um, so as a result, my research at the George is focused on women's exclusion from biomedical research. Next slide, please, Anna. Women are underrepresented in medical research. There is no question about that, from stroke trials to autoimmune projects. Um, an example that was going around Twitter just um, this week with International Women's Day was that 70% of chronic pain patients are women but 80% of chronic pain studies are conducted on men and male animals. So this is despite women being greater consumers of healthcare. Um, we take more medication, we go to more doctor's appointments. So this makes, um, makes us particularly vulnerable to the gaps in the evidence base. Next slide, please. There are many examples we could discuss today, and I'm sure we will, um, that show the bad practice of making clinical decisions for women based on studies conducted on men. Men and women are often given the same doses of drugs as just a standard. Um, so such practices risk over medication of women. So for example, in my line of work in psychiatry, um, with antipsychotic medication, a 2021 paper showed that women don't receive the clinical benefit that men do from high doses of drugs. But so drugs like amisulpiride, aripiprazole, these, these classic antipsychotics, 
but they do experience more side effects. And, and um, as the slide says, it's almost twice as common for women to have these, um, these adverse drug reactions compared to men. It is, of course, important to recognize, though, that for many drugs and treatments, there is no sex difference. It will, um, the drugs will respond the same in men and women. Treatments will be equally effective. But we do need to do that sex disaggregated analysis to know when that's true. Next slide, please. So to find out what the UK was doing to address this research gap, um, our research group at TGI in London, in the UK, um, posed a simple question to the largest research funders and regulators in the country. So I contacted 21 of them to ask whether they have a sex and gender policy in place for the research they fund. So Anna, if we could launch the poll, that would be great. So I'm interested what you would expect, you know, how, how many of these uh, leading multi-million pound um, organisations, um, I won't name and shame, but you can imagine which ones I'm talking about. What, how, what percentage has a sex and gender policy for the research they fund? So we'll just have 10 more seconds or so. Right, well, um, you were about as optimistic as I was going into this project that, you know, we'd find some, we'd find some leading lights, some thought leaders, um, but that 29% of you uh, are, are right. Unfortunately, we asked this question and 0%, not a single one, has a policy for sex and gender integration. Next slide, please. And yes, we are far behind. So other countries have had these kinds of policies and packages for sex and gender integration for a long time. Um, the US, not a leader in all things healthcare, but on this front, um, what did, did this quite some number of years ago, Canada, um, and more recently, the European Commission. So there's an international review um, being led by Londa Scheibinger and uh, Lillian Hunt at the moment. And, we're really excited to read the results of that work. So they're looking at what are the international best practices for sex and gender inclusion. We're also very excited that they're going to be working with us uh, on our project. Next slide, please. Critics at this stage may say, OK, it's all very well having policies, um, but even if there is one in place, do we know that they actually work? Do they increase what they're trying to do? Um, and we already know that they do do this, thanks to Haverfield and Tannenbaum's 2021 paper looking at the Canadian context. So they analysed nearly 40,000 applications made to the CIHR in the last decade since multi-component sex and gender interventions have been established. Uh, a policy has been the centre of that, of that kind of in, um, initiative. Um, and the paper found that integration of sex increased nearly fourfold and gender nearly threefold uh, over those 10 years. Reassuringly, applications that scored highly for sex and gender integration were more likely to be funded. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, projects with a PI who identified as female were more likely to include a sex and gender analysis. Next slide, please. So back in the UK, we're now in phase two of our project. What started as quite a small thing, we sort of felt compelled to take it forward and we're very excited to have that opportunity. So we've applied for funding from the Wellcome Trust to, um, to build sex and gender policies for the UK, for these funders, regulators and for the public. So our aims are to um, encourage or really insist upon sex and gender plans to be included on application forms for research funding, even if that's to justify why such an analysis um, wouldn't be relevant to, such, to a particular project, um, to increase sex disaggregated data analysis. And we recognize that we're starting from a very low bar, 0%. Um, you know, this is not part of our research culture in the UK at the moment. So we need to train researchers and evaluators about why this is important 
um, and moreover how to do it well. Next slide, please. So this is an outline of the project. Um, we're currently in, in stage two, in the planning stage. Um, and two key aspects I just want to draw out of this. The first is co-creation. So this is our whole approach to the project. So we're working with funders, with regulators and patients to produce these sex and gender policies so that they work for an inclusive and diverse public. Um, we don't have strongly preconceived ideas about what these policies will look like. Uh, and I think that's really important in, a, in an open project like this. The other aspect which um, isn't on this diagram, but is really key to our uh, to this project is um, our aspirations for it to be intersectional. So we are trial trialing the co-creation methodology around the question of sex and gender, but we do very much want to expand this work to focus on race and age and socioeconomic variables. Next slide, please. So we have a brilliant dynamic team for this project. It's very exciting. It includes clinicians, researchers, policymakers, and patients. Um, but we are at the early stages, and this is by no means a closed group. Um, it's not a finalized um, team. And we do recognize we have a lot to learn from other projects and other experiences. So we'd be delighted to hear from you if what I've said resonates with your work, you have ideas for us, you'd like to collaborate. Um, and I hope that next time we meet, I'll have good news to share about the state of sex and gender equality in the UK. And just on the final slide, please, Anna, um, here are my contact details. Oh, they're not on that slide, but um, I can put them in the chat uh, afterwards and I'd be delighted to hear from any of you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate, for making that very clear and showing us the interdisciplinary teams that you've brought together to to make this gender aggregated information really a viable option and something that's gonna be ingrained in these institutions. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to Sandia now to get us started on her presentation. Thank you, Sandia. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. Uh, and I'd like to begin by saying, although I'm not a transgender person, I relate very closely to this issue because of my work with gender justice. It began with just you know talking and focusing about women uh, and then moved on towards men and how men could you know um, be a part of expanding this the rights for women and empowerment for women and then it took went on to the next stage of working with transgender people so can i have the next slide please yeah so the poll question could we have that on before we proceed the question is if you felt trapped would you try to break free? So we're waiting for the results. Yes, excellent. Can we have the next slide, please? So not surprisingly, could you many of the trans people also feel trapped in the wrong body and what they are trying to do is break free from this prison in which they are but unfortunately this is not what it is recognized as and trans people face discrimination they are um, treated badly they are marginalized they are victimized because they want to break free from these shackles can we move on please the next slide so very briefly, I'm just going to focus, no, the previous one, please, yeah. On the context, because I'll be speaking about transgender population in India. Uh, we have a sizable transgender population, 48, 480, uh, 100,000 people uh, are trans in India. And while the NALSA judgment did make a little bit of movement in the sense that it recognized trans people as persons and gave them rights, they actually continue to be discriminated against. They face a lot of rejection. They experience high violence. They're rejected by their families and are often homeless, jobless, have very low educational uh, qualifications. And therefore uh, they face a lot of discrimination and violence. And the result is not surprisingly a large number of mental health problems. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, this slide just focuses on some of the statistics around the mental health problems that they face. So uh, as you can see, 
42.7% suffer from moderate or severe depression uh, when compared to the cisgender population or cisgender meaning people who identify in the gender that they are born in. Uh, it's 4%, um, but here it is 42%, so huge numbers. 37% struggle with alcohol abuse. Suicide rates are very high at 31%. 48% suffer from psychiatric disorders. But despite all of this, a study that has been conducted showed that none of them sought any kind of consultation or treatment for these problems. COVID-19 has amplified the distress that they face. In a recent webinar that we had held, uh, people talked about how you know, their only sources of um, income, which is uh, sex work and beggary, were hugely affected because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And a lot of them faced a situation where they had no food to eat. Uh, so despite being a very, very serious problem in India, the mental health of transgenders is under-researched. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Stigma worsens the entire situation for transgenders. So generally, mental health is stigmatized. But when you have the transgenders face this, it's even worse. And stigma can operate at three levels. One is internalized stigma with the trans people themselves face because of their, you know, their orientation to themselves, the entire treatment that they face. So all of that leads to an internalized stigma. There's interpersonal stigma. This is a stigma that uh, cisgenders have towards transgender populations and this keeps puts them in a situation of great risk so they risk physical assault they risk sexual assault and finally there is also structural stigma so the laws of our land the institutional policies uh, all of them limit the resources and opportunities that transgender people have so there is no scope for them you know to get education, there's no encouragement or inclusion in schools and colleges. Uh, there is no reservation for them in jobs. People do not want to give them jobs, as a result of which they are actually forced to do work that they wouldn't ideally want to, like getting into you know, beggary or being forced into sex work. And all of this then impacts their physical as well as their mental well-being. Can we move on please to the next slide? Uh, so future directions, first I feel that much more research is needed because uh, the problem is not properly and adequately understood. So it would be very useful if research was conducted to understand the resilience, the coping mechanisms that transgender communities in India have. What is the effect of a peer support group, for instance, or family acceptance, uh, or having supportive partners, or having support from the community? Also, what does it mean uh, for agency to be developed. So transgender people coming together as activists, you know, fighting for their rights, does that have any impact on their own um, well-being, on the feeling of connectedness and self-acceptance, accepting their own identity, being at ease with it? What does that mean and what does that translate to when we are talking about mental well-being? So I think all of these areas are in need of grace research because none of that exists. Uh, can I have the last slide, please? Uh, so now I'm coming to the question that you had asked, Diana, what does advancing equality for me mean? It means a state or a situation where trans women in India do not need to come out into the streets to fight for their right uh, to be accepted as they are. So I'd end there, thank you so much. Thank you, Sandhya. Thank you. This is so fascinating and, and really interesting and such necessary research. Um, I look forward to asking you some questions afterwards. Now over to Cristobal. Yes, good morning. Yes, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Um, Thanks very much uh, to the George Institute for this uh, invitation. Uh, the next chart, little slide, please. Uh, it's clear that the foundation, health is the foundation of societies, economies, and communities everywhere. Uh, when I look at Mexico and Latin America, the power and the importance of women and making sure they have equal rights is fundamental in our future growth. But it's also important to say that 
women's health remains a back burden issue in Mexico, Latin America, and around the world. The next chart, please. Uh, from AMIF, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, we're clear and we have adhered to our strategy to 2030 and how we can contribute to sustainable development goals. Uh, in particular, five, extreme poverty, obviously good health and well-being. Uh, women's health is not only a woman's issue, it's a society-wide issue. We're talking about decent work and economic growth and, and women have an incredible uh, opportunity if we give them the right uh, the rights and all the benefits to really uh, show their impact in, in the economy, in the well-being, and also in the social development, uh, creating innovation and infrastructure. That's something we're doing from our side. And obviously alliances are very important for us. And through our alliances, we're really making a difference and an impact uh, on women in general and women's health. The next chart, please. Uh, talking about women in Mexico, as you can see in the last 20 years, today of our population of 126 million inhabitants, women represent almost 52% of the population. We have 65, 66 million women in, in, in Mexico. And again, when we look at the future, the opportunities is real to develop and prepare all the environment for women to be able to believe, help them develop themselves and grow the economy. That's the, the, the major opportunity. And just some statistics for you. 80% of women in Mexico today uh, are in poverty or have some kind of vulnerability, which is incredible. And we have almost 40% of women without social security. So that, those are big issues, unacceptable today, and actions need to be taken to change that situation in Mexico. And I would like to draw a, a question now in the poll, if you can help me, Anna, please. Looking at the last presidential election, basically what percentage of, of women uh, voted in the last election? If you can help me with your answers, interesting to see what, what, what's your perception. See what answers we're getting. So as most people think between 31 and 50%, the, the uh, reality is that 66% of people who voted in the prior election were women. That shows the strength, the importance that women have in our, in our economy, in our development, so that's something the power of women has seen. And we saw it last, last Tuesday when we came out and all the women came out and marching. And I'm very happy to see how this movement is growing and really fighting for the rights. We have to change the situation right now and make sure that's on the top of the agenda. The next chart, please. As, as, as my colleagues have said before, uh, cardiovascular disease is the number one situation of, of deaths, more than 6.6 .6 million women die, die per year. This is a critical problem. And we look at these diseases are often undiagnosed in women as the clinical profiles are often different to men. The next chart, please. Cancer continues to be a, an incredible issue. Delay in, in treatment, delay in diagnosis. that's a critical point. As you may know, Mexico has a lot of communities far from cities. So this is something that has to be tackled early on autoimmune diseases, uh, usually impacting women at different stages of their life. These are things that have to be elevated and actions must be taken. And I'm not mentioning mental health. Mental health prior to the pandemic was already a major issue in the, in the country. Uh, and as we move on and come out of pandemic, I'm sure that the information will say that mental health in women and men, but predominantly women, for a lot of reasons, home violence, a different set of situations through these two years of pandemic have created a major issue, stress, job loss more in women than men, and actions definitely have to be, be taken. The next one, please. Based on all this and the need for information, we don't have sufficient information. Uh, over a year ago, we contacted through a good friend of mine, Brendan Shore, Robin Norton and the George Institute with their expertise 
globally, and we partnered with the Georgia Institute and the National uh, Public Health Institution in Mexico to develop the first study that will be talking about economic and health impacts on non-communicable diseases in, in women. This is the first study conducted in Mexico. We think it's a breakthrough, and this will be a first time where we can measure uh, the social, the economic impact of the system and not attending correctly women. That will be a, a critical uh, finding of this study. Obviously, uh, one of the goals of the study is to understand the impact of social determinants on health from economic stability, how it impacts education. Healthcare is fundamental and there's, there's a lot of delays there. Neighborhood and environment, social community and context. So this will be key things that we will be looking to develop information, which is critical right now. We don't have on the next chart, please. Obviously, when I look at the, at the country, we have a lot of diversity. So it's not only checking the information in major cities, we have a lot of disproportion. We have obviously major cities where in general, we may have a good system, but we have over 2,471 municipalities and 471 are indigenous population where they really don't go by the rules, by, by traditional rules. And obviously in those situations, women are our priority. So this study will be very inclusive. We'll be finding out information in the different Mexico, so we call it different situations to make sure we can come up with different policies and recommendations. As you know, in three years, we will have a next election and we want to make sure that all this information, and this is the first study of a set of studies, we can elevate this as a, as a priority for the next government to take care, better attention, a better system, understanding the reality of what the impact is today for, for women in the society. The next one, please. And with this, basically, this is a very simple presentation, but the, again, we need to elevate the importance of women in society. Uh, it's a key factor for growth in Mexico. Thank you, Cristobal. Thank you so much. So I wanted to see if we have any questions in the um, Q&A box so we can get started. Please pose your questions so that we can ask our panelists I wanted to, to, to start um, by asking all of you, and, and you know, there, there clearly is a lack of awareness around the need for research, the need, the, the, the reality of non-communicable diseases um, in, in communities around the world being so urgent, an urgent matter, and understanding that gender plays a, a critical part, the fluidity of, of gender and how communities are defining gender, that there is a lack of general understanding in all of these areas that you've touched on today. Can you give me a solution on what we can do? Because you're all doing the research that's critical for it. But what could our, our audience members begin to, to do within their own work as individuals in their own communities to ensure that there is that awareness? Who would like to take that, that question? I'll just throw it out to any of you. Okay, I'd like to go first. I think what could help is really having uh, campaigns and large scale campaigns around it, where you know you have, um, and it's not just that when you have a campaign for transgender rights, you only have transgender people out there, you know, talking about it. But a campaign that is inclusive, that has people who uh, care about the issue, you know, come up and talk about it. Uh, establish that transgender people are people. And as citizens of the country, they have equal rights to anyone else. And, you know, just because they fee or just because they identify with another gender, it doesn't mean that they should be discriminated. And this um, campaign should also talk about mental health because generally the awareness of mental health within India in a country like India is very, very low. And that uh, adds to significantly to the stigma. So, you know, both of these going hand in hand using creative methods, I think is very important to um, create awareness and then reduce the stigma around it and increase the acceptance. Thank you, Cynthia. Cristobal or Kate, do you want to respond to that question? 
Yeah, of course. I I think um, internationally, but particularly in the UK at the moment, questions questions of sex and gender are particularly contentious, and there's a really fierce public discourse around these questions. Um, and I think what we're trying to do in our project is to, through co-creation, to make a space where different opinions can be voiced and there can be sort of creative solutions which aren't um, binary black and white, uh, aggressive, um, you know, sort of rival camp type uh, arguing between different um, positions. So it's really an appeal for a sort of kind of public discourse around these questions and for um and certainly i think that that kind of inclusivity is absolutely critical to what we're doing um but yeah certainly in the uk it's quite um it's quite rare at the moment to uh to find that desire to understand the other side thank you kate christobal do you have a comment on that last question yep well first of all i have to say that when we look at our our uh, congress 50% of our Congress are, are women by regulation. But I think we do have a lot of leaders today in, in, in different parts of the country. I think we have to continue elevating uh, again. I think people have to understand that our future development depends on how we improve the rights of women. That That's for sure. And uh, we've got to make sure not only the rules and regulations, but we have to create a culture of inclusion. I think that's critical. Again, I think mental health is going to be the critical point now. We have to first uh, elevate a campaign to uh, eliminate the stigma. There's a big stigma. No one wants to talk about that. We know it's happening. Uh, we do, so we have, to, we have to just recognize uh, the issue right now, talk about it, and see how we create programs that really support, in general, the population. Uh, but my personal belief right now is that, in this case, women are really affected because one of the things of the pandemic was when someone had COVID, it's usually the women at home who have to uh, take care of the relatives. And we, we've, got, we've got to start changing that. And that means that they leave the jobs to take care of the relative, the father, the brother, the kids. We've got to start elevating that to make sure that they have exactly the same rights. And, and we have to pick up from our side and we have to start taking other responsibilities to really free the women to make sure that they can uh, really start developing all their potential. I think that that is a, a, cre a critical discussion in the next two or three years in Mexico. Well, Cristobal, thank you for, for that. And thank you for, for representing a country that actually requires as its legislature, half of the, half of the legislature being uh, women. Um, in fact, you are one of the three countries in the world, um, which is, you know, very telling in terms of how we can begin to ingrain the, the principles of, of equity um, and equality within those, those powerhouses. Um, so thank you. Thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, I, I know that resources came up in, in all of the, the presentations today and the lack of resources. So how, how can we better advocate for the resources to build really the important evidence base we need um, in these areas, be it research, be it community programming. I'll turn it over to, to Kate and then Sandia and, and we'll close with you, Cristobal. So I'm struck um, by how few people know how significant this problem is, particularly about uh, under research of um, women's health. I think um, through no fault of, of anyone, I, th I think many women assume that the evidence base is equal, that the treatments they get are researched and they are safe. Um, and I think even after the, the huge success of Invisible Women, um, the book by Criada Perez, which was an international bestseller, but, but here as well, um, there was shock about that. But then I think there was an expectation that things would be swiftly fixed and everything would become very quickly much better. Um, I even had that expectation going into my research. I thought, surely, you know, surely after that book and, and the much wider public discussion, um, funders and, and regulators would, would be on this issue. So I do think awareness raising is really critical um, and to raise people's anger about this inequality. I mean, it's, it's, it's outrageous that we live in societies where this goes on. 
Um, and I think when people are angry enough and demand that this is rectified, then the resources will possibly quite slowly, but they will follow. Thank you. Sandhya? Yeah. So um, mental health research to an extent is funded, uh, but when you come to transgenders, you know, everything kind of focuses on AIDS, right? So there is a lot of support and a lot of fund for work around AIDS with transgender communities um, because they are seen as one of the main, you know, the spreaders in a way. Uh, but, but when you talk about funding for other areas of transgender work, it's been a struggle. Uh, I know of transgender community-based organizations who have applied for funds that are meant to you know, nurture them as an organization so that they can work with other transgenders to make the situation better. But because they don't get adequate funding, they don't have the initial capital needed you know, for the funder to invest in them. And that I think becomes in a way a deterrent. Uh, so if we could have more of organizations or more of funders who invest in two extremely important streams. One is intervention around the work with transgender people and the community, bettering their life chances and their situations. That's extremely important. And the second is having this stream around research because research, as I said, is inadequate, especially around the mental health of transgender. So if that would, could also be strengthened, I think it would be great. How we could put it out there is, you know, talk more about the issue, raise, uh, the profile because there's not much discussion done around that uh, and I think that would in a way perhaps writing more articles and bringing out this as an important issue which needs resources could um, interest funders to you know actually invest in it. So Johanna I saw that you joined us you're, you're back on so I yes. would love to have you address thank you for joining us we know being a mom and professional apologies. is no, please do not apologize. We, so we, it, it's the, it's the strength of women to do all sorts of things at <laughs> once. So you're multitasking. So Thank Joanna, you. we wanted to, to ask you, we know that, um, you know, in the region of, of Africa, and the, there has been a very strong women's, you know, women congregating together as community health workers and taking the lead in sort of the health space. What would you say that, you know, in your research, what's been revealed as one of the, you know, it, it sort of denotes the funding issue and to do it is, mm -hmm. is one piece. The other is the capacity to understand, have the knowledge around um, non-communicable diseases and being able to then transfer that knowledge to community base. Talk to me a little bit more about that. What was, what was really sort of, you know, a highlight of how we need to move past, you know, how we need to, to accelerate that work so it doesn't, it, it, it can be part of the, the nature of the work that they are currently doing as women activists in their communities. I mean, I think, I think a critical piece there is really establishing better partnerships and bridges. And I think, um, you know, you know, when we published the report and disseminated the findings, I think there was actually shock even among the organizations to realize just how many were working on these issues. Um, and, you know, if there was a way to better connect um, groups, and I mean, we did, we did this survey, you know, there's this huge um, language barriers, for example, simple things around translation, uh, making evidence more accessible in this way so that groups in Francophone Africa, you know, Lusophone Africa, there's the North, the Arabic, um, how can we better make those links uh, in a simple way, facilitate sharing of knowledge, um, of, you know, understanding of what are some of the barriers, because I think there are lessons to be learned um, there. And I think there are simple steps that can be taken relatively quickly, obviously with resources. And that's, you know, that's, that was linked to the, the most recent question um, uh, that Sandy and Kate were answering, you know, in terms of raising the funds to be able to do this. Um, and I guess if I can touched on that a little bit in this brief response is that, you know, up until now, health was not prioritized. Even you know, if we look at government spending on health pre-COVID, it, it was a minimal proportion of the budget, right? Um, suddenly in the last two years, 
everyone is talking about public health. And I think this is really an opportune moment for us. Um, and even as part of those conversations, I think issues around inequality, issues around um, care, unpaid care work, and, and the burden that falls on, on women, the disproportionate effect it has had on, on other you know, marginalized groups, how we think about how we think about this has been brought to the fore. And I think is not something, I mean, we could turn away, but now is really an opportune time to seize and ensure that, you know, like Kate said, we demand more um, and yeah, create perhaps an accountability mechanism to ensure donors are required of all, all, all uh, funds that, that they give out, that there is a gender dimension to it. And it's very actively included, for example. So thinking about accountability perhaps as well. Okay, so Joanna, you got us started on the call to action that I was gonna put to, towards to everyone. So our, your call to action is to have some kind of accountability, whether it's in government or even in our respective organizations to make, make this very clear around gender. Um, Others, Cristobal, we'll go around and we'll we'll have you tell us what do what's your call to action to the audience. Well, one definitely we need more more funds. Uh, the funds have raised mainly due to COVID, but also COVID has, what has that generated is a delay in 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 diagnosis and treatment of cancer and other types of problems as as is going to bring a higher effect of people coming later to to get attended to. So I think we got immediately turned back now, almost post COVID to making sure that we have the right system, primary care attention, that is that is critical. And then how we reduce inequality. We have an incredible amount of disproportionate inequality. We have an experience in Chiapas uh, with a clinic that has been there for 20 years, very successful. We helped them with a, with a new building where they can right now educate patients and most of the patients are indigenous, indigenous population, mostly women. Now they can educate them, but also it gives them the opportunity to continue working. These people live on a daily income. So they need a place while, while they're expecting attention, they can work. So I think we have to address that to first reduce inequality. And second, uh, we need more infrastructure. We need to develop, we, our doctors disproportionately are in major cities. So we have to review the, the, the universal health coverage, how it's handled now, and we need a complete change for the next two or three years. And definitely we have to raise the voice of women. Uh, we need to create all the measure, necessary measures, because again, if we wanna grow our country and we know we can, the women will be critical in this development for the future. So actions have to be taken, and we are at least taking measures from our part to making sure that that voice is elevated. Thank you, Cristobal. Kate? Thank you. Yeah, my, my call to action is to fellow clinicians, I think. Um, sometimes I think we can say it's all it's all government or it's all sort of patient activism, but I do think clinicians play a really important middle role in um, educating themselves about the sex and gender gaps in their knowledge, particularly within their own specialism. And within reason to communicate that to patients, to be honest about the things we don't know. And I think patients then might become more aware that this is a, a huge issue, particularly women um, and other um, trans, trans patients, uh, intersex patients, patients who don't fit easily into the sort of sex binary. Um, and I think it's only when there is an open dialogue between clinicians and their patients about the treatments they take and that they're, that they're prescribing and that the patients are taking um, and the uncertainties around them that, that we're going to make some change. Thank you, Kate. And to close us off, Sandia. So I'm just going to extend what Kate said. And I would say it's not just the responsibility of the clinicians, but it's the responsibility of the education system, you know, the training that they give medical doctors. And uh, how do you, so I think right from the start, it has to be this recognizing that gender is just not the binary male and female, but, you know, going beyond that and then making them sensitive to the fact that it's fluid and it's okay, right? So that when you have a, a discussion with your uh, the patient who comes, you are not prejudging and you're open. So I, I would feel that it, it has to start at the level of education 
um, and the government certainly needs to also think about because we have such few trained mental health professionals in India. You know, how do you uh, train people, uh, the staff, the doctors in the primary health center level so that anyone who's presenting themselves with a mental health problem, it, it's recognized. There's some level of treatment done. And then of course, if there's more uh, complications, you refer them to a specialist. And anyone who comes in is treated with respect and dignity following human rights based approaches. I think that's my call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for beautifully having us see ourselves in each of you. I think we, you've told us we need to remain vigilant. We need to claim our space. We need to collaborate with the vision that achieving gender equity is the rising tide that lifts all boats and everybody wins. Um, today, you, you, know, you have showed us the inroads that we're making in gender equality through your research. And I just wanna thank each of our presenters and each one of you who have joined us today. Thank you to the team at the George Institute that's been behind the scene and have made, have made this possible, especially Anna Alden, their call out for you. Goodbye, adios, savoir, auf Wiedersehen. And until next time, I want you to take good care of yourself. Bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.